Hi, I'm Ethan. I love muzzle loading, and these are some interesting original muzzle loading air rifles. The flintlock I have here is a unique 18th century engraved and, and relief carved English flintlock ball reservoir muzzle loading air gun by Edward Bate of London. Bate, who lived from 1743 to 1810, was one of the most talented late 18th century gun makers and was active in London. Though this example looks like a flintlock long arm, it's actually a muzzle loading air gun with a copper ball reservoir. Ball reservoirs were in use in the late 17th century and had the added advantage of being easily swapped out. This smooth bore part octagon barrel measures approximately 50 caliber with a swamped muzzle. Air guns like this were primarily used for hunting. Wind guns had several advantages over conventional firearms at the time, including that they were quieter, smokeless, quicker to reload, and relatively unaffected by rain. They also required less cleaning since they did not require corrosive black powder like flintlocks that this example is modeled after. Starting with this flintlock version here at the back, at face value, apart from the ball reservoir here underneath the fore end of our lock, this looks like a fine English fouling piece until you get a little bit closer. When we look at the lock and lock plate region here, we start to get a clue that this might not be your typical flintlock muzzle loader. It does still load from the muzzle, it is still a muzzle loader, but as described here, it does not need any black powder to use and, and to function. While researching and looking at this piece, I was curious as to why we would have a full flintlock mechanism here if it wasn't necessary to discharge the projectiles. In playing with this here a little bit, I wanna go through how this works and how it's cocked and quote, primed. Like many fouling pieces, we only have a single trigger down here, so we do not need to set our trigger. We can cock the cock here to half cock. Notice that large click, just like we would with any flintlock muzzle loader. We close our frizzen here. The frizzen doesn't really do anything on this lock, but halt the cock as it falls. We can bring this back to full cock. Notice the large click when we do that. And then we can pull it past half cock, gently release our cock, let it strike the frizzen, and move forward. Now, pay attention to that. I'll do it without talking here. I'm not sure if you can hear it, but when we bring the cock back, we have a first cock at half cock, our second full cock. As the cock falls past half cock, there is a slight catch there. I believe that to be the actual trigger for the prepared air charge to force our projectiles out. Because we don't have a true touch hole, we have kind of a, a false touch hole set into this barrel here. We don't have any priming powder. I think the action of that cock falling at, after half cock here is the actual release for the reservoir, not necessarily the trigger itself. Just found that to be super interesting. Really wanted to share that with you. The ball reservoir here, I don't have a lot of information on how many shots could have been taken with each reservoir here but the reservoir simply unscrews. Now these reservoirs are a little bit different between these pieces that I have here to show you. This one screws onto this entire assembly with threads and, uh, and a nut coming out of, I guess, the breech of this air rifle here. On the top face of the barrel here, where our rear sight is directly above where the ball reservoir threads into the barrel, or the assembly for this muzzle loader. We have a larger section of this barrel coming off, I believe to accommodate the threads or the air rifle assembly itself here. But you don't really notice that until you get right up close with this piece. Kind of speaking to the ensemble as it sits here, 
Other than the ball reservoir and the modified flint lock here, it looks very much like an English fouling piece. We do though have a rear sight on this piece and it is a smooth bore barrel. So we could consider this to be a smooth rifle if we wanted to discuss it in those terms. It has some of the characteristics that we see in other smooth rifles for the time. The barrel itself is an octagon about a third of the way up from the breech and the rest of it is round. Our front sight again is a very low to the barrel front sight here. It's a simple blade front sight with our notch rear sight back here just forward of the lock. We have the maker's name plate set into the barrel here. And interestingly around our rear sight here to jump back farther on the gun, uh, much like we see engraving on the locks of true flintlock muzzleloaders, we have some sunburst and some scroll pattern engraving here around the thread section of this barrel here as we look at it from the top. Again, kind of marking and ac accenting the real key points of this muzzleloading air rifle like we see on other muzzleloaders. Coming back to the breech end of this barrel, we have some engraved bands following the facets of the octagon. And our tang is a real classic English tang here with some beautiful floral and scroll engraving around our tang screw. Surrounding the tang itself here on the back end as we go back towards the wrist, we have some beautiful English relief carving here of some scrolls and some uh, flower or, or seashell motifs folding in and over themselves. Back through the wrist, we get to be a rather plain stock here into the cheek rest and our butt stock. There's no true cheek rest on our side plate side here. It's the same on either side, like we see in many traditional fouling pieces. The butt plate is finely engraved and we have some nice shaping here on the top crest of the butt plate. No patch box on this piece like we would typically see on many other fouling pieces. On the side plate side of this muzzle-loading air rifle, we have a mirror image of the forestock. We get back to our side plate mortise and we have a finely engraved, bright silver colored side plate with engraving that matches what we see around the rear sight of this muzzleloader and really in, in tandem with our tang and our breech bands here around the barrel. Jumping over to our more percussion looking air rifle here, this American muzzleloading air rifle dates to around the mid 19th century. It features an octagon barrel chambered in 40 caliber with five grooved rifling and a dovetailed German silver bead front sight. Although it is a later version of a muzzleloading air rifle, this percussion looking half stock air rifle has a different design for its ball reservoir. You can see here on this ball reservoir, this thread design really emulates and, and is very similar to air reservoirs that we see today in modern air rifles. And I find that to be super interesting, just wanting to point that out there. Now, while this muzzleloading air rifle is not as obvious to be uh, a percussion half stock rifle here as the flintlock that we have on this table, from a distance, this would still look like a percussion rifle. I think it's, it's very interesting here to look at this lock itself though, there are a lot of variations here. On our lock plate side here, you can see we have a large exterior spring. I believe that this spring has been pushed to the exterior of the lock because our ball reservoir and the actual air input assembly on this rifle takes up our space inside the lock mortise where we'd see these lock internals be typically. You can see up here on this flintlock version, much of the action on the inside of a flintlock is going to be back here towards the breech end, but on this piece here, we have it pushed to the exterior and forward. On the top, we have our hammer. Uh, it's a very mid 19th century hammer assembly here, very similar to those that we see in several military arms. Um, it really looks like uh, that of an Enfield or a trap door hammer here that has been modified. I don't believe it to be an exact duplicate. 
pulling our hammer back here slightly, you can see our, for lack of a better term, firing pin underneath the hammer on the top barrel flat of this barrel. I believe when the hammer falls, it activates this pin, which releases the pressurized air, forcing our projectile forward. Overall, this is an interesting piece to me. From the wrist back, we have a very traditional American long rifle styling here. We have a faceted brass butt plate, and we have a horse head motif patch box on this piece that has been engraved very well. There's a lot of running leaf designs here with stems on this five knuckled patch box here. Taking a look at our toe plate on the underneath of this rifle, we don't have an actual patch box release button in our toe. The back end of the toe plate is the release. It is spring loaded in itself, connected to our patch box release so that we can activate and pop open our patch box here. You can see we have about a two inch or so patch box to accommodate some small patches. Because we're into the 19th century here, we start to see that shrinking patch box design. And this piece itself is rather short and light. It could uh, accommodate a child marksman, I think, very well. Coming forward, we have some simple wrist checkering here and some incised line carving around the tang of the barrel. Forward here, we have a full octagon barrel. We do have a wooden half stock here. And then where our offhand would rest on the stock, we have some more checkering. Our rear sight is interesting. We have what looks to be maybe um, an oyster or pearl uh, inlay here at the very front end with some file work separating our forend of the, the rear sight from the rectangular rest of the rear sight. This rear sight is uh, adjustable, it looks like, for three different yardages, uh, which is interesting, even though this is a small bore, small 40 caliber barrel here, we do have some uh, adjustment in this sight. Towards the front end, we have a rather tall blade front sight compared to some of the other earlier 18th and 19th century pieces that we see, possibly to accommodate the adjustable rear sight that we have back here. I want to point out our barrel under rib on this piece is made of wood. It looks to me to be a piece of oak that does have some incised line carving on it to hold our front ramrod pipe to the bore. So while we do have a wooden half stock, our fore stock and our barrel under rib is made of wood, which I find to be just utterly interesting. On our side plate side of this piece, we have a traditional American long rifle style cheek rest with a half moon crescent inlaid on the top of that cheek rest. I'm a big proponent of using air rifles as a means to practice your shooting capabilities in a quiet, affordable sense, especially when it comes to practicing for muzzle loading. And finding a variety of muzzle loading air rifles this week at the Rock Island Auction Company was just fascinating to see two of my passions kind of intersect here in a means that, um, you know, does the same thing that many of us see today. We are seeing an increase in popularity of modern air rifles with large reservoirs. So it's fascinating to see it done 200 plus years ago, like we have with these examples. I'd like to thank the Rock Island Auction Company for giving me the opportunity to show you these pieces here today. If you'd like to see more high quality photos and videos of antique arms, check out the Rock Island Auction Company social media pages. I'm Ethan. I love muzzleloading. Thank you so much for watching. We'll catch you next time. So that we can activate and pop over. Checkered 